Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this CFCA webinar, Flying Over the Radar, Changing Practice to Support Children and Families Where a Parent Has a Mental Illness. My name is Rhys Price Robertson, and I'm a researcher and PhD candidate at Monash University, where I'm conducting qualitative research with families in which a father has a mental illness. Until recently, I was a senior research officer in the CFCA Information Exchange. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the topic of parental mental illness looking particularly at the ways in which service providers can and have been working towards improving outcomes for families where a parent has a mental illness. The webinar will provide participants with an overview of the work undertaken at a national level to implement practice change and to develop resources for the workforce and for families. This webinar is part of a series of resources that CFCA is releasing on supporting families where a parent has a mental illness. The CFCA paper on fatherhood and mental illness is already available, as is a number of short articles, and we will send you links to these after today's presentation. Before I introduce our esteemed speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we are meeting. In Melbourne, the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to the elders from other communities who may be participating in this webinar today. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's two presenters, both of whom are heavy hitters in the field of parental mental illness. The first is Brad Morgan. Brad is the director of the Children of Parents with a Mental Illness National Initiative, which is more commonly known by its acronym COPMI. COPMI is administered through the Australian Infant, Child, Adolescent and Family Mental Health Association. Brad trained as an occupational therapist and has experience in public health, mental health promotion and prevention, workforce development and early childhood programs. In his current role, Brad works with the COPME team to partner with family members, professionals and organisations to support the development of national strategies to improve outcomes for children and families where a parent is experiencing mental illness. The second presenter today will be Rose Cuff. Rose is an occupational therapist who has worked in child, adolescent and adult mental health services since 1986. Since 1995, she's focused specifically on the area of supporting families where a parent has a mental illness through direct clinical practice, through creating and implementing peer support and group programs, and through developing resources and conducting training and research. Since 2007, Rose has worked as the statewide coordinator for the Families Where a Parent Has a Mental Illness Strategy, or FATME, which is based at the Bouverie Centre in Melbourne. The FATME strategy is a government funded initiative aimed at building capacity in services to, better, to promote better outcomes for these families. Now I need to alert you to some brief housekeeping details before I hand over to Brad and Rose. One of the core functions of the CFCA Information Exchange is to share knowledge. So I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar. There'll be a bit of time at, at the end for questions of, uh, so we're trying to respond to, these as, uh, to as many of these as possible. We also want you to continue the conversation we begin here today. To facilitate this, we'll set up a forum on the CFCA website where you can discuss the ideas and issues raised, as well as share some of your own experiences. And we'll send you a link to this forum later this afternoon. Please remember that this webinar is being recorded and that the audio transcript, transcript and presentation slides will be made available on the CFCA website in due course. Okay, that's it from me. Now I'll hand over to the first of today's speakers, Brad Morgan. Uh, thank you, Rhys. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar as well. Um, Rose and I'll be talking about what the work that both of us have had the opportunity to be involved with through the COPME initiative and that's through the National Program and the FATME Initiative or Strategy, which is in Victoria. Um, while both initiatives have different names, the focus of our work is on the same population group, and that is children under 18 and families where a parent experiences mental illness. The focus of my presentation will be on the national context and the learnings that we have had since the initiative started almost 14 years ago. And then Rose will continue to talk about the Victorian experience of, of implementing the FATME strategy in our presentation today, you'll probably notice that many of the learnings we talk about are consistent, and this isn't a coincidence. Um, the work we will describe has been a result of partnerships and relationships that we've developed locally, nationally, and also internationally. 
Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the passionate team that I work with at the Australian Infant, Child, Adolescent Family Mental Health Association, who have had the privilege of working with. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of Elizabeth Fudge, who was the director of the Cotton Initiative from 2001 until 2012, who has worked extremely hard to drive this, this initiative forward and establish international and national relationships that continue to assist many of us to progress this work today. I'd also like to acknowledge the support provided by the Australian Government, who have provided funding to scope, establish and support the initiative since the original scoping project commenced in 1999. And another group I'd like to acknowledge today is the family members that our team has a privilege of working with across all areas of our work. The saying nothing for us without us resonates strongly in our team and we value the passion, enthusiasm and honesty of family members who are at the centre of the work we do. So to get started, I thought I'd provide a quick background to what we know about children of parents with mental illness and the reason why this is a group of interest in the community. Um, what seems to be of particular interest in the community is the question, does mental illness run in families? The short answer to this question is, it depends. There is a large amount of research occurring locally and internationally, and we're learning more and more from studies on prevalence, risk and protective factors, genetics, neurobiology, trauma, and research on the determinants of health. For this reason, this area of work draws on multiple theories and conceptual understandings, and there is no single grand theory that underpins the work occurring in this area. A major reason for the focus on this group is the population of children living in families where a parent has a mental illness. Historically, there's been very little data regarding the number of children of parents with mental illness in Australia. Um, and while this is still the case in many organisations, we do have a number of prevalence estimates that have been undertaken in, in this country. A fairly widely accepted estimate is that around 23% of Australian children have a parent with mental illness. And so that's around 1 million children. Um, and this appears to be consistent with estimates overseas. Another reason for the focus on this population group in the community is that this population group is recognised to be more likely to experience social, emotional, developmental and educational difficulties, as well as being significantly high risk of experiencing mental illness, with estimates that risk is two to three times higher than children who have a parent with a mental illness than those that don't. Before I continue, I'd like to highlight that not all children will experience difficulties and many children are thriving and can develop strengths from their experience of living in a family where a parent has a mental illness. For this reason, I think it can be helpful for everyone to conceptualise children's needs falling across a continuum ranging from thriving and well at one end and then we move across to children who are at risk to children at the other end living in environments where their wellbeing or safety is of major concern and are possibly in contact with services such as CAMS or um, child protection services. The other thing to point out is that children are moving across this continuum back and forth at different times of their life, depending on their life context. So when you might see a child in infancy, they might be at one area end of that continuum and move across back and forth before, they're, um, before they turn 18. So what are some of the things that influence child and family wellbeing? Once again, the answer is it depends. Every child, parent and family is unique and children in the same family often have different responses and outcomes as well. In regards to parental mental illness, we know that specific diagnosis can provide some predictors of child potential, potential child outcomes. For example, children of parents with depression do have a significantly higher likelihood of experiencing depression themselves. However, the research indicates that parental diagnosis is not as strong as associations with other factors such as the duration and intensity of symptoms that the parent experiences and how they impact on parenting and the parent-child relationship. For example, a very brief but severe episode may have less impact on children and families than a moderate but long-term episode that has cumulative impacts over a longer term in the child's life. Another thing that many families and professionals identify as having an impact is the actual impact of the treatments for mental illness themselves. Um, we do know that there is a real juggling act in trying to balance the impact and side effects of medications and how they have flow and impacts on the parent, parenting capacity in the parent-child relationship. We also know that mental illness is also often part of a range of other issues related to relationship problems, social and financial challenges and broader determinants of health. So when thinking about the impact of these issues on individuals, we also need to recognise that they do have flow on effects to 
the parent-child relationship and children. And for many, we know that they may have had, for many parents, we also know that they may have had their own experiences of trauma and disadvantages of disadvantage as child, children, and that these may have also been experienced across multiple generations. And we also know that other vulnerabilities, such as drug and alcohol, family and violence, homelessness and mental illness do often co-occur. And there's a lot of um, research demonstrating that these children are particularly vulnerable when there's the accumulation of these issues um, occurring in families. Um, so I've given a bit of an overview of some of the challenges and issues that families experience, but I thought it would also be important to point out that a lot of work has been focused on the processes that can support children to develop and thrive in the context of mental illness. Um, some of the processes that have been demonstrated in research is a commitment to support, maintain and strengthen parental capacity in the parent-child relationship. Um, this is evident in parents prioritising and really working hard to maintain their relationship and their parenting responsibilities in the context of the many challenges that they face. Um, and now another powerful process is when children and families can work towards mutually understanding what they have experienced in relation to parental mental illness. For example, this is when parents and children can have those open conversations over time where they can talk about their experiences, try to make sense of those, and with the goal of, um, I guess, helping children to develop a sense of hope about the future, um, that these are temporary issues that can be separate to them, but also that they aren't responsible for causing or resolving the issues that their parent experiences. The other process that can support children is their active involvement in the community, such as opportunities to have positive experiences of education, play and involvement with community groups. Um, the other area is obviously having a supportive network of relationships, both within and outside of the, the community, at good times, these relationships are supportive for their participation and well-being, but also these relationships enable responses and supports to be activated when children do experience problems. So it's really about having someone looking over and supporting children when needed. Um, and that's also about supporting and helping children to identify the right supports when they're needed. Um, and so that might be just activating natural supports that are within the child's network to actually accessing services that might require specialist support such as mental health services and um, health services and child protection services. Another powerful process for families is their sense of hope about the future. And while hope is obviously probably more based on my conversations with families and parents, um, I think there is a strong sense that parents hope for the their, their own future and their own recovery is strongly intertwined with their hope for their children's future. And so if they're feeling hopeful about the future for their family and their children, I think their own hope is further strengthened by that process. So I think that's an important principle that I think all of us can apply to our work and practice is around the generation of hope, both for children, parents and families. So I'll move on to talk a little bit about um, some of the interventions and evidence that have emerged, um, particularly over the last um, two decades. Um, we've seen a number of prevention interventions and strategies emerge that have been designed to improve or prevent difficulties in children of parents with a mental illness. And a recent systematic review and manner analysis examined the effectiveness of these interventions and found that selective interventions or selective prevention interventions are effective at decreasing the risk of mental disorders in children and can be effective at reducing the likelihood of children developing the same illness as their parent by around 40%. I won't go into detail on interventions here, but we have been working on how some of these interventions can be applied in the Australian context. Rose and I'll talk about one example later in this webinar. And not surprisingly, the strongest interventions appear to support the protective processes that I just described on the previous slide. And these tend to be targeted either towards the parent on their own towards parents as a couple or parents and children together. So I've just provided a very brief background to the current context um, and evidence around children and parents with mental illness. But I would just like to point out that if you are interested in learning more, I'm sure there'll be lots of um, articles and resources available on the um, CFCA website after this 
um, webinar. But I'd also like to point out that um, in 2012, the Cotman National Initiative um, sponsored a Medical Journal of Australia supplement, which has a number of articles which to provide a good summary of evidence and thinking in this area, including some of the interventions as well, which can be accessed for free on our website, which I'll give you the, which will be listed on the, at the end of this webinar. The next talk, part of my talk will be about the Cotman National Initiative's response and strategies that have been applied over the last 15 years. However, before I do, I thought it was important to highlight the focus on children and families where a parent has a mental illness has a long history that goes back a number of decades and well before the establishment of the National Initiative. The foundation of this work has been driven by a number of champions who, through either lived experience or professional practice, have been able to highlight the needs, strengths and challenges experienced by parents with mental illness, their children and families. In Australia, the 1990s saw an increasing national focus on children and parents with mental illness. On screen, you will see a couple of quotes taken from some studies and work that were undertaken in the 1990s. And a key finding of the work in this um, era was looking at the finding that children of parents with mental illness were flying under the radar in the community and in the services that were working with parents. So in a sense, children and the needs of children were invisible and there are limited me mechanisms of support for children of parents with mental illness. Because this metaphor of the invisible child has been used quite a lot, I'll be using this as a helpful way to conceptualise the principles of underpinning our work through the Cockney National Initiative, and this will be reinforced by the work that Rose will be talking about through the FATME strategy. I'll be using this concept of the invisible child over the coming slides with the intention of helping everyone reflect on how visible children are in the context of parental mental illness in our organisations, including the things that contribute to children being invisible as well as some of the processes that can increase the visibility of children. Something I think we all need to start with and start thinking about in general is what do we mean by children being visible? Everyone has different understandings of this, so it's something that we all need to work on developing and developing common understanding of what we actually mean by what is a visible child. For the purpose of my discussion, my meaning does not necessarily refer to children being physically visible in services, although I do recognise that this does have benefits my meaning relates to what we know and understand about children's strengths, their vulnerabilities and the context of their lives, including the things that influence their wellbeing and development, such as their relationships, both in families and in the community, and their access to support networks that strengthen their development and wellbeing. So, so the theme of our webinar today was looking at flying under the radar to flying over the radar. So I thought, give a bit of context. Um, for children to be visible, there needs to be an alignment of many different levels of work to support and highlight the visibility of children across different levels within organisations to support practice change. And this requires a conscious effort. Because these levels are so big, I obviously can't give you too much detail around each of these <laughs> levels because I'll be talking for quite a long time. Um, so I'll give you a bit of a snapshot, but I'd really like people just to have this opportunity to think about these different levels and where they sit within the, this level, I guess, of systems that influence practice change and what they can do within their network of relationships and supports and their role to increase the visibility of children. I'd also like to point out that we use this tool or this conceptual tool to, in our work and find that it helps the people that we work with to think more systemically about the different layers of work that need to occur to support practice change. And part of that is also thinking about the different levels of readiness at different levels of this system that we're talking about today, recognising that often the different levels of readiness are different across all of these, even within the same system or organisation. So the first layer I'm going to talk about today is the systemic level. Um, and this describes things such as policy, legislation, and then um, broader policy standards that influence um, how, I guess, visible the services are, children are and the services that are delivered through policy initiatives. In Australia, we've seen a positive movement towards increasing the visibility of children through a number of major policy and frameworks. Um, some good examples of this include the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, Mental Health Workforce Standards, and at a state level, we're starting to see the needs of children and parents articulated in different pieces of legislation, such as mental health acts, as well as in policy and reports and strategies that are being developed around vulnerable children. 
And Rose will be able to talk a little bit more about those in her strategy, particularly in the Victorian context. I think a common thread among many of these policy documents and frameworks is recognition now that children's wellbeing and safety is everyone's responsibility, irrespective of whether people are working in adult, child or family focused services and that we all play a role. From a practice change level, I'd just like to highlight some of the resources and I guess strategies that we've applied at the Cotton Initiative to support practice change at a systemic level. Um, some of the major things is obviously contribution to some of the um, policy and frameworks that have been developed over time, such as the National Framework. Um, late in, um, or I should say in 2009, COPME um, sponsored a systems change report, which articulated different approaches that services, organisations, states and territories were using to implement organisational changes to support children and parents with mental illness. And from a COPME initiative, we also have a state government mental health department reference group, which helps us to work together to see where different states and territories are able to apply some of the learnings and principles to support practice change at a policy level. The next layer I'll talk about is at the organisational level. And there are a number of services um, that we can use, I guess, as exemplars um, that have made significant changes to improve the visibility of children and, in their, and their needs. Rose will give you some good examples, I think, in the Victorian context, so I won't go into significant detail other than to say that some of the things that are helpful for organisations is obviously recognising children and that children should be articulated in an organisation's mission um, and that needs to happen at a peak level. The other areas of work is moving down to things like policies and procedures and how this relates to the actual work and practices of the staff that are in the organisation. Also to the finer detail of things such as ensuring things like job specifications for staff, staff selection processes and funding models and corporate strategies that aim to ensure that ch practitioners are keeping children and families in mind. From a COPME level, I guess as an initiative, some of the strategies that have developed over time, and I guess with us, because it has been a 14 year project, um, some of the work, I guess early work was developing a document called Principles and Actions for Supporting Children and Families Where a Parent Has a Mental Illness. And this document articulated some core principles and some broad actions that services both in adult, child and family services could apply to respond and support children and parents with a mental illness. More recently, we have been working on the experience is that both states, territories and organisations have had in regards to applying some of those principles and actions. And so we've developed some implementation guidance materials that we're currently piloting, which really look at how do we support organisational change? What have we learnt from the organisations that have done this well, as well as some of the organisations that have had some real difficulties of pushing this agenda forward. The next level I'll discuss is at the supervision level. We do know that the supervision, this worker supervisor relationship has a powerful potential to promote child awareness or inversely child invisibility in practice. In our work, um, working with both professionals and organisations and supervisors, we do know that there is a lot of pressure um, both on workers and supervisors at the moment and quite a long time around developing skills and quite often professionals don't have access to supervisors outside of the performance management context. So there isn't often a space to unpack the work that they're doing, which is quite new for a lot of services, particularly in the adult space. So through regular and consistent supervision, we know that when supervisors ask questions about parenting and children, there is, I guess, prompts that workers can use to think about children's needs and then explore that in further detail. From a resource level, um, we're fortunate to receive some support through the Child Aware Initiative to develop a Child Aware e-learning course that aim to assist supervisors in adult services, including mental illness, our mental health services, drug and alcohol services, homelessness services, um, and a number of others to really think about some of the challenges of providing supervision in adult services and how they can better support workers to focus on the needs of children. The next layer down I'll talk about is the workforce or frontline service level, which is really um, dependent on where the profession is working. It could be in either the adult, child or family space. Um, so there are different principles, but underlying this, I think there is a common value in the work and intention of the work. 
But I think one of the major learnings that we have had is that um, across all of these services is the needs of adults when they are experiencing mental health problems or other associated difficulties can often dominate the focus of an intervention delivered by any of these services. And it does require a deliberate and conscious effort to attend to the experience of adults as parents and explore the needs of children to the extent where workers actually have to prioritise and make decisions about prioritising the time to actually have conversations about parenting and children. It just can't, doesn't happen automatically. So I guess a lot of the work that we've been looking at is about how do we support conversations about children and the role of parents in supporting the safety, wellbeing and development of children in routine practice. And this, across, this occurs across all levels of intervention, ranging from assessment to therapies to follow up um, and all in between. Um, so I guess at a practice level, we do also know there is a continuum of child visibility ranging from not being identified at all to collecting basic information about children such as names and ages to asking about problems or waiting for parents to raise those problems to the end where we would like to see, which is where there is a mutual understanding both between both parents and the professionals they work with about the child, their strengths and vulnerabilities and knowing the context in which children live a method that we're currently working on to support these conversations to happen as part of routine practice is a Let's Talk About Children program. Rose will be talking about this in a little bit more detail as well as I'll go into more detail about that later in the webinar. I'd just like to highlight from the Cotme National Initiative perspective, a lot of the work that we have been working on has operated, I guess, across continuum. Um, and I think that has happened earlier on. A lot of work was focused on raising awareness and providing services with basic principles to support children and families. And a lot of this work was originally focused on adult services. Since that time, we've seen the emergence of a number of um, evidence-based programs and interventions. And so as time progresses, we are seeing us work towards how do we apply evidence-based interventions into practice. And I think we can see that continuum moving from raising awareness to actual practice change. And that's we're in the middle of that process and I think it's quite exciting to see what's being taken up and the enthusiasm of the workforce using some of the interventions that have been developed. Now, uh, move on to the parent and child level. I'd just like to point out, because of the focus of this webinar is on practice change, I uh, won't be talking around the parent and child level significantly today, other than to point out um, that um, similar to the continuum concept I've been talking about at the other levels is that there are a range of resources for both parents and children, which are on the following slide, but um, that aim to both raise awareness um, and provide resources for parents and children at that level of raising awareness to moving across to things that they can apply that might be evidence-based strategies such as talking with their children about what's been happening, setting up for the care of children when things not, might be going so well for the parent and a range of other strategies that can be helpful for them. Once again, I thought it would just be important for me to go back to talking about our lived experience partnerships um, that are at the centre of the work of the Cotme National Initiative. Um, for us, um, I can't underestimate um, how important family members have been in working with us across all of the layers of the work that we've tried to look at and that's that I've been describing on the previous pages. Um, we have been fortunate to have a great group of family members that help us to understand what is needed and to drive the layers of work forward. And I think this has been an important lesson for us, but I think it's also an important lesson for all services that need to strive towards active partnerships with family members at all levels described on the previous slides. Now I'll now hand over to Rose, who will talk about the FATME strategy in Victoria, um, which is one of it's one example of the many strategies occurring across Australia to improve outcomes for children with parents with mental illness. Thanks, Brad. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here talking with you all about issues that I'm very passionate about. I'm going to spend a bit of time describing some of the work um, being undertaken here in Victoria to bring about a change in practice. It's a slow and steady undertaking. It's a bit like the tortoise, not the hare. Um, so I'll briefly describe the FAPME service development strategy that Brad's mentioned and the reform context within which it sits. I'll also describe the uh, large scale trial of an early intervention approach, which Brad's mentioned called Let's Talk About Children, originally from Finland. And then I'll also talk about the recent uh, 2015, which is this year, publication of FAPME practice standards, which we're very excited about. 
The context to which I'm referring is multi-layered, complex and constantly changing. And I'm sure many of you listening also work within a very complex um, uh, place. Um, here in Victoria, it includes a new Mental Health Act, embedding the recovery-oriented framework and a renewed and strengthened focus on vulnerable children and families. The inquiry conducted into vulnerable children and families in 2012 resulted in a range of recommendations in Victoria, and this is designed to drive the broad-based change required across government and in the community to achieve better outcomes for children over the next decade and beyond. I'll talk a little bit about the Mental Health Act in Victoria, just because it's been a very powerful, um, uh, I suppose, a change agent in about bringing about change in practice. The Mental Health Act includes a number of principles, as 12 overall, to guide the provision of mental health services, and three of these specifically direct a focus on children of clients receiving mental health services, and they're on the slide. This provides some rationale and even, dare I say, leverage to change the way parents and their children are identified and offered support at entry to a mental health service. The new Act in Victoria also has provisions around supported decision making and client-centred care, including the nominated person and carer provision. This acknowledges in legislation that children and young people may in fact be taking on roles with caring responsibilities. Again, this legislation can assist in driving further change in practice and the reorientation of adult services to be child and family inclusive, collaborative, and importantly, to bring the child into the space and be visible, as Brad's talked about already. It's my turn to do a few acknowledgements. Um, the FATME strategy is funded by the Department of Health and Human Services here in Victoria. And there are senior clinicians employed as FATME coordinators at 11 of our 22 area mental health services. The strategy was launched in 2007 and is a unique initiative in Australia and I, and I reckon internationally, actually. The Bouverie Centre is responsible for the coordination of the strategy or the implementation of the strategy. The Bouverie Centre, where I'm based, um, is part of La Trobe University and combines clinical family therapy, model development, academic teaching, qualitative and quantitative research, workforce development, and community education in one integrated service. And it's a fantastic place for me to be, particularly around learning about implementation, which is the way to go. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Mel Goodyear, who's currently research fellow at Monash University, School of Rural Health, and an adjunct researcher at the Bouverie Center. She's the principal researcher of a randomized control trial of a parent recovery intervention, which we'll talk about, let's talk about children. Mel has made and continues to make a very significant contribution to the research in this field, both here and overseas. And finally, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the incredibly skilled and passionate team of FATME coordinators across the state and the many practice champions who support them and the many people with lived experience to inform our work. The overall aim of the FATME strategy is to reduce the impact of parental mental illness on all family members, especially dependent children, through capacity building, systemic and sustainable change. The actual initiative, and we used the word families intentionally at the time in 2007 to encourage a systemic response. It grew out of a three-year, a lot of work, but most recently a three-year pilot evaluating peer support programs, most notably PACTS, paying attention to self, and CHAMPS, children and mentally ill parents in Victoria. It was a conscious move on the part of the government to invest in a capacity building service development initiative rather than purely direct service initiative. And this has been critical, I think, in the work that's been undertaken in Victoria. The value of peer support for children is not in doubt, and I'll return to this later, but there was and always is a need for service improvement um, implemented in a coordinated, sustainable way. The decision to locate the positions and embed them within public mental health services was a highly strategic one, and it shone a light fairly and squarely on mental health to address their practices in regard to this population. The scope of the strategy is very wide ranging and these are strongly influencing roles. 
The faculty positions act as boundary spanners, to quote my manager, Brendan O'Hanlon, across service sectors and have a clear focus on supporting change in practice. I believe the strength of this initiative lies in the recurrent funding of the positions, the go-to nature of these roles, that they operate within ideally an authorising environment, and the depth of the relationships that have been fostered over many years, well, since 2007. The strategy has three objectives, which are on your slide there. Increasing the capacity of mental health services to provide a family-focused response. Increasing the capacity of basically everybody else that works with families, what we call network partners, to recognise and respond to FATME, and to establish and strengthen the networks and support structures. The work, as I said, sits within a broader framework of adopting family inclusive approaches, such as single session family consultation, broadly family sensitive practice, multiple family groups and many more. But the real challenge here has been in making, as Brad has said, children, parents and families visible, but particularly working with the concept of families tends to bring to mind family of origin rather than family of procreation. And that's been the real challenge, is bringing the children into the debate. I also want to mention the broadening the lens beyond mental illness. And, and as I said, Brad has, has talked about the complexity that exists for many families. Um, we initially focused on working primarily with adult mental health services. The strategy was enhanced in 2008 to a bit more EFT and to broaden the reach of the work into the AOD sector and beyond in recognition of complexity. The child death review reports and recommendations conducted by the Office of the Child Safety Commissioner here in Victoria consistently make the link to vulnerability and the coexistence in particular of family violence, parental substance misuse and mental illness. And certainly more recently with Rosie Batty's debates and her um, talking um, openly about family violence, it's come back into the spotlight. And I think it's important to talk about mental illness in that context as well. Recommendations consistently state the importance of partnerships in protecting and caring for children in the critical issue of identifying parents and dependent children. And this is consistent with the Commonwealth Government's uh, child aware approach in that, as Brad said, protecting children is everybody's business. I'm going to talk a bit more about changing practice or practice change. Um, this slide really just very briefly uh, summarises what we've been doing in terms of working with adult mental health service worker practice alongside organisational practice. Uh, and there was a starting point for the work and all along we have taken an implementation approach to work systemically to drive change. And I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about some examples of changing practice in the following slides. Brad and I have talked about implementation, so you'll probably get a bit sick of us talking about it, but it's been a, a driving force for us and many people who work in this field. It's a key vehicle for changing practice and making it sustainable, which is what we all want. The FATME strategy has worked with individuals and organisations to move away from a providing of just training, or as somebody once said, a train and hope approach, to adop adopting evidence based methods and an implementation approach. Establishing readiness, knowledge building, including consultation and relationship building, skill development and support, culture and environment and making it family ready and friendly, uh, implementation, evaluation and monitoring, and hopefully ending up with sustainable practice change. I'm sure many of you listening to this webinar work using implementation approach, but I just needed to emphasize that. This um, slide describes the some three, three areas in which the FATME strategy has been working to change practice. Changing workforce practice on the left, changing organisational practice and enhancing service delivery. In 2012, there was a targeted evaluation of the FATME strategy uh, conducted by Monash University, Professor Daryl Maybury and Associate Professor Andrea Roypert. The themes from this evaluation suggest that the practice change was occurring across these three dimensions. 
Pivotal to the uptake of these changed practices is the presence of the FATME coordinators and other roles within the organisations, what we call them champions sometimes. Changing the practice of workers, which is the left-hand column, includes formal training, um, which has included using online resources that COPME have provided, individual support, secondary consultations, placements, cross-placements, reciprocal placements, coaching and mentoring of individual practitioners um, and support. There's been a lot of work around tool, providing tools. So one example I'll talk about in a minute has been in one area of developing prompts on lanyards that individual workers can actually wear and refer to when they are um, with clients and with families. Changing the practice of organisations includes reviewing policies and procedures and making sure that FATME issues are constantly included and referred to. Partnership agreements that have FATME on the agenda, practice guidelines and assessment procedures. In, in networks, there's been a lot of work undertaken across FATME areas and FATME catchments to broaden the scope of networks to more routinely include FATME issues, FATME conversations and bring it into the space rather than just talking about families broadly. Documentation is constantly reviewed to make sure that wherever possible, parents and children are identified, not just ages and gender of children, but also trying to get a snapshot of how children and families are travelling. The right-hand column is enhancing service delivery, and that has been possible through the FAP initiative through brokerage funding and coordination, and I'll talk about some examples of that in the next few slides. So this slide just gives a bit more, a few examples of how we have, um, we believe that workers have been changing their practice. It gives an example of the Keeping Families and Children in Mind Supported Implementation, which is an e-resource um, that COPME have developed. And that was done, it was a supported implementation using FATME coordinators and practice champions to uh, deliver this across a number of different adult mental health sites. The Keeping in Touch with Your Children is an inpatient initiative that's been done in collaboration with a number of different services and is encouraging parents to actually keep in touch with children when they're an inpatient and training staff to have conversations with parents about their children when they're in hospital. We've also had joint training calendars where FATME coordinators have actually worked collaboratively with family services, with child protection, and with mental health community support services to share uh, and work together on training, which has been extremely helpful. Some examples of changing the practice of organisations. Uh, I'll just go through a couple of these. And I've mentioned the policy for children visiting inpatient units. One of the uh, really exciting one has been the inclusion of uh, core components of working with families, parents and children into the mandatory and essential skills training calendars of mental health services. So that along with the other um, uh, components around, you know, risk and assessment, perhaps, you know, fire drills, many mental health services now in Victoria have uh, core components to equip staff and to understand what parents uh, might be presenting with, to what questions to ask and how to support parents and children in adult mental health services. There's also been a number of audits um, undertaken across mental health to collect numbers of parents and children. And audits in themselves are a very powerful tool to raise awareness when you're asking mental health practitioners, how many parents do you have and how many children, what ages, where they're living. It immediately raises awareness and invites practitioners to reflect on their work. The last part of the uh, that column, the last column on the right is enhancing service delivery, and this is a direct service component of the strategy, and that's been made possible through uh, collaborations, through partnerships, and through some brokerage funding. So I'll just mention a couple of these briefly. Um, the supporting kids in primary school um, is an early intervention program uh, for providing information to children and teachers in primary schools. And the Aboriginal FATME project is another initiative 
in the southwestern part of the states in, Warnham, in the Warrnambool area uh, to improve resources and services to support southwest Aboriginal parents and children in families where parents have a mental illness. There's a range of different um, programs that have come about as part of the Fat Me initiative. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the second component of my of uh, my talk is let's talk about children, um, which is an Australian first recovery model for parents. Um, it's a it's a brief two to three session recovery oriented intervention developed in Finland, and the potential of this model to equip practitioners to more routinely identify parents and children early is significant, not least because it doesn't require children to be physically in the room. Um, but also that it uh, allows uh, adult focus workers to elicit information about children in working with, with parents. It's an evidence-based program which suggests that even a brief intervention can improve outcomes for both parents and for children. These are the it's a, a large number of people involved in this Mental Illness Research Fund project, which is funded by the Victorian government. It's a four-year project and we're about halfway through. This, um, this study aims to adapt Let's Talk for Victorian adult mental health services and other sectors in mental health, develop an evidence base for the model for each sector, see if we can roll it out on a larger scale, and see if it uh, has economic value. So it has a, it's got very large aims, but it's very, very promising in how it's um, progressing. The next slide really tries to summarise, um, it depicts the parallel processes, what we're finding out about from our work so far over the last two years and before that, about the benefits of Let's Talk. And it seems that, a par and this slide I attribute to Mel Goodyear, um, it depicts the parallel processes of change occurring as a result of Let's Talk for both the parent client on the right and the practitioner on the left. We think that this occurs because the parent is empowered around their parenting role, this model places the parent as expert in their children's lives. And the model significantly strengthens the rapport between the parent and the worker. So we're very excited about the potential for this uh, model. We're also talking about the capacity to trial it in different sectors um, and working collaboratively with, with COPME and other, or other parts of Australia and the world to perhaps adapt it in other settings such as prisons, in family violence services, and even rehabilitation services. So to say that we're excited about Let's Talk would be an understatement, and I'm sure that Brad will talk about opportunities for people to be involved in further work in this area. The last slide really is to bring to people's attention that here in Victoria we have been developing some FATME practice standards, and this was uh, these have been very recently published in the International Journal of Mental Health Nursing. They were developed in response to questions from clinicians in adult mental health about how do, how do we do best practice and questions from managers about how can we measure and monitor good practice in relation to this population. The challenge will be to progress these standards and there are five stages through to monitoring and evaluating care how to progress these into core practice in adult mental health and beyond. <clears throat> we are developing um, conversations with a range of people, including the government, about how it can be progressed and work in collaboration with um, people with lived experience, practitioners and managers to get these standards implemented across Victoria. So I'm going to um, hand back to Brad now to talk, to go back to let's talk about children and the National COPME Initiative. I was just going to briefly highlight that the COPME National Initiative has been working um, for the last two to three years on developing a range of materials to support implementation of Let's Talk across Australia. This includes a freely available e-learning resource, a manual or guide to assist professionals to put the intervention into practice, um, and there's also some resources available for both parents and young people that go along with the intervention. And at the moment, we're currently piloting a set of resources which assist organisations to recognise that where they are, I guess, on a continuum of readiness on those layers, 
that I discussed earlier, and then providing them with a scaffold of resources that have been developed over the last 15 years to, that they can use to, I guess, improve and increase the readiness to be able to deliver programs such as Let's Talk About Children. The other exciting thing which Rose mentioned, I think, is the capacity for this resource. Obviously, we've had a strong focus on adapting it for adult mental health services at the moment, but it has strong capacity to be used both in a number of adult services, but also in child focused services, particularly organisational programs such as early child education and care and primary schools and secondary schools, as well as family services. Um, and just so that you know, um, if you aren't familiar with it, um, there's a whole range of resources, including most of the ones we've talked about today, available for free on the COPME website. Um, there is a culture, I think, of sharing and collaboration yeah. in this area. So I think um, organisations can go to the website and download and use things in their practice.